We have with us this evening Dr. Meghna Dasani, who practices in Houston, Texas, as well as Rose Nearman, the founder and CEO of Nearman Practice Management and creator of the Dental Writer software. So um, we're going to start this evening hearing a little bit from uh, Dr. Dasani on managing the child airway in the dental practice. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dasani, for uh, bringing all your knowledge uh, to us this evening, and we're really looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was an amazing introduction. Man, I need to bring you on board here. But <laughs> um, thank you guys for taking time out. I know beginning of the week is always so crazy. I know it is for us. And um, but I'm truly passionate about sleep apnea and especially peds because if we can fix these kids, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen while I'm talking. Um, if we can help fix these kids for lack of a better word while they're still growing, that, um, that would be an amazing service that we are able to offer to these kids. There we go. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not technologically challenged typically. Here we go. Okay, great, your screen's coming through clear. Perfect, perfect. So the sooner we can um, identify these issues in these kids, and a lot of times what we see and what you will find is that each kid is going to present differently. You could have two siblings with mom's, mom is complaining of completely different symptoms. One probably wets their bed and the other has ADHD or signs and symptoms of you know, any other issues that we may relate with sleep disordered breathing, which is where um, us having the opportunity to have these conversations with parents to open up their thinking, because think about it, who is ever in their right mind going to think, speaking to the dentist or the hygienist when your child is having a cleaning, um, even think about mentioning bed bedding in a 12 or a 14 year old. I mean, how embarrassing, right? But it's up to us to be able to connect the dots for these parents, get them thinking as to, hey, maybe this is what it is if we've exhausted all of their options and us looking for those subtle clues because we're in their mouth for that whole hour. So I think that truly helps us address these sleep problems in children, you know, re opening the eyes for these parents as to maybe there is more, maybe this kid, my kid isn't quote unquote a bad kid, because I've always said there's no such thing as a bad kid. It's always a tired child, right? Because kids present differently than adults. I know when I am tired, we all tend to drag, right? Where I'm exhausted, I'm gonna go lay on the couch or don't talk to me, don't, you know, I don't wanna do anything. But if my kids are tired and those that have kids in their lives, which I'm assuming is everybody, be it your own child or a niece, a nephew, a neighbor, a grandchild, they're all over the place. So kids present with things differently than an adult would. So what are the common symptoms that we will see children present with in case of sleep disordered breathing? They're not getting enough oxygen. They aren't sleeping well. What is it that we're going to see? Snoring is the most common one, right? And I tell parents, snoring is the, the easiest one for parents to identify and bring up with their dentist, with their pediatrician, if they're seeing an ENT. And um, one of the tips that I give my parents is if you're having a hard time having the ENT or the pediatrician, give importance to the fact that the child snores because I know living in Houston, everything gets attributed to allergies. Yes, allergies play a role, but for parents to be able to, I tell them, take your phone and record your child when you notice them snoring that is going to be able to give the pediatrician a visual of what it is that you see every day, what it is that is concerning you about that child. ADD and ADHD, um, again, very common. There are studies out there that show almost 50% of these kids, you know, they, take a they took a group of kids, 
um, that had a diagnosis with ADHD and just fixed their sleep. They helped them get healthier sleep, helped them get better quality sleep. 50% of these kids did not meet the diagnostic criteria for ADHD once they addressed their sleep issues. So that is something that's very important to, if they need the medications, they need the medications. There's nothing, you know, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But if we can prevent a kid from getting to the point where we need to give them the Adderall, where we need to give them the Ritalin, every drug comes with its own set of side effects. So if we can help them avoid that, we need to address, we need to try that first. So any mom, any parent, any kid that presents to the practice, in my office at least, and I see a yes marked off on ADD, ADHD drugs, there's you know medications that they're taking, I ask them, the first question I ask is, has this child had a sleep study? Have you evaluated their sleep? Have you had these conversations with the pediatrician? So just helping to guide them into getting these questions answered. Um, bedwetting as well. Uh, we see too many kids that are 12, 13, 14 year olds that complain of bedwetting. Any child that has been previously dry and has everything else checked off, no other UTI issues, no, you know, every other specialty pediatricians have ruled out other causes. I always encourage parents get their sleep tested. Mouth breathing is also a symptom. Morning headaches, kids that wake up grumpy in the morning, kids that are bare to wake up in the morning. I have two girls. My older one is bright and sunshiny. Some days I can't deal with that. And then the little one is unhappy about waking up or used to be unhappy until we addressed her sleep. So those are things to look for. Those are things to educate parents about because a lot of times it's like, oh, you just, she just wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. Well, if it's happening consistently, if it's an everyday occurrence, nobody can be in a bad mood every day. So let's see where this is coming from. Nightmares as well. Um, chronic allergies, I know I mentioned it earlier. Again, making sure we are addressing or working with their pediatricians or ENTs to address the allergies, but making sure there isn't an underlying cause as well. Swollen tonsils, that an evaluation for, you know, a tonsil eval is always my first recommendation to parents. If we're looking in their mouth and I notice tonsils that look like they don't belong there, I encourage them to go get um, those tonsils evaluated with the ENT. Always, always helps. Sleepwalking and talking, even tooth grinding. Um, definitely, we need to have those conversations and uh, daytime sleepiness. Kids that wanna fall asleep in school, we have a little girl that always takes a nap in the third period. I'm like, no, 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 that's not right for a nine-year-old child. Let's see where they're not getting the rest that they actually should be instead of thinking, oh, she just needs a nap every day. No, not when you're nine. So what are the major risk factors for obstructive sleep apnea in kids? Tonsils and adenoids, hypertrophy of the tonsils and adenoids is a big one. Remember I said, we always send these kids for a tonsil eval um, if we do notice enlarged tonsils when we're doing our oral examination. Obesity, unfortunately, in today's day and age of computers and video games and Netflix and handheld devices um, and fast food, this is becoming a very important factor to consider when we are thinking about healthy sleep in kids. Neuromuscular disorders and also craniofacial anomalies, if they have a retrognathic maxilla, if there's skeletal discrepancies, those are things that do contribute to sleep apnea in kids. So what we see as symptoms, that is what children present with to us. We know what the problem is, or once we have a diagnosis, we know where that problem is but we really have to make sure that we are addressing the cause. 
what is it that's causing it? Because unless we address the cause, what is it that we're doing for all of these kids? We're just putting a big old Band-Aid on whatever's wrong with them. And it's so important to make sure we're getting to the root of what is causing this. Is it mouth breathing that's contributing to it? Is it the position of the tongue? Do they have a tongue tie? Does that need to be addressed? Do we need to get them into myofunctional therapy? Do we need to expand them? Do they have narrow palates? Or is it the position of the jaw? Which direction do we need to, what is it that's causing it so we know what to fix? Because remember for peat sleep, there is no one size fits all. We have to make sure we are addressing what it is that is causing these issues for these kids rather than just put Band-Aids on whatever's going on. The sad thing is an estimated nine out of 10 kids suffer from one or more of these problems. And I speak with dentists all the time who go, but I have an adult practice. Believe it or not, I do too, or I did, until I started to look for, I always branded myself as, we don't see kids, ours is a family wellness-based practice. I love doing cosmetics, which I still do, but just starting to have these conversations, you could see adults over 40, and that could be your niche, but you have to remember these our parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts that have kids in their life. So whether or not you are actually treating, which I would highly recommend, it's, these are lives you're truly changing, but having these conversations helps them get answers sometimes because these are parents that are usually going from doctor to doctor to doctor looking for answers and they are getting answers. It's like the story of the elephant and the blind man, right? And this blind man was taken to an elephant and all he was allowed or all he touched was one part of the elephant. The answer, the quote unquote diagnosis was what that person was touching. So I may have an obstetrician that only looks at, oh, this is a preemie baby, or I may have a lactation consultant that looks at, there's a difficulty latching on, maybe we have a tongue or a lip tie, or you could have the preschool teacher that talks about ADHD which is where we come in, we're able to connect the dots for these parents, looking, taking two steps back and looking at the big picture, basically being the person that connects all of these to have this answer for the parents. Because we can look at the big picture because we have these clues that their clinical exam is going to provide to us to say, Yes, maybe this is an issue. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, let's consider this without us actually diagnosing anything because we can't diagnose sleep apnea, but we sure can see what it is that's contributing to it. Mouth breathing, I used to think was super cute in puppies and babies and not anymore because we know that um, this does contribute to so many issues. What are the physical traits of a child that is a mouth breather? That long face, dropped eyes. I always tell doctors, look for the outer corners of the eyes dropping down. Dark circles under the eyes, the venous pooling, narrow nostrils. They have some form of nasal obstruction, be it a deviated septum, be it enlarged turbinates, something that's contributing to, I need air and I'm going to get it no matter how. And a lot of times, most of the times, it comes from that mouth breathing. These are children with a high palate, a narrow upper arch. We do tend to see a lot of malocclusion in these kids open lips and dry or chapped lips. When I walk into the operatory, when I have a child for a recare, for recall, hygiene's waiting on me. In our practice, parents are allowed back into the room if they choose to be there. When I walk in, I almost ignore the child, not because I don't like kids, I love kids, but I want to make sure I am evaluating them at their so-called normal or rest position. Because what happens when we are at attention trying to be at our best or pay attention to whoever just walked in? So 
So I almost rather have the child lay back and watch whatever it is they're watching on our overhead TV or if they're sitting and staring at their phone, because that lets me evaluate, is that their normal rest position? Are they, are they mouth breathers? And once I'm talking to mom, that comes up and I'm like, oh, do you look at that? Is that her normal, is that how she usually is when she's watching TV? And a lot of times you see that click happen in mom's head going, Yes, I never noticed it because that's their normal. That is something that they don't pay attention to. That's their kid. They see them every day. ADHD, who wants this kid, right? After we get home from work, poor baby. We know that um, during sleep, we know that the brain is consolidating memories, right? It's healing itself. That is what the brain does. If the body is waking itself up to breathe, if that brain isn't getting enough oxygen, if there's constant arousals to make sure we're getting to the oxygen level that we need, we know that this is going to lead to poor quality sleep because this child is never going to be able to get the deeper stages of sleep that he or she needs to. And if they're waking up partially, then this child, this person does not know, they do not realize that they have been awakened but that partial arousal is happening. These are micro arousals and it can occur multiple, multiple times during an hour. And like I said, it does prevent the child from reaching deep sleep. Again, how do we know this? You cannot know this without a sleep study, which is why when you see some of these signs and symptoms, we want to be able to connect the dots for these parents. And in kids, we see that sleep disordered breathing leads to daytime sleepiness because they're not rested. And these are kids that end up with behavior issues such as that, that mimic ADD or ADHD. Like I said earlier, kids that come in and moms have marked yes to ADD, ADHD, or I see drugs on the medical history, I always ask, have they had a sleep study? Have you had their sleep evaluated? So 81% of kids who snore and have ADD could have their symptoms eliminated by having their sleep issues treated. So there was a study that they did in um, kids in the age group of around four to five years old that did have ADHD. They found that they were more likely than kids without ADHD to have trouble sleeping. And a lot, they found that this was, this could be related to enlarged adenoids. By ages of six to 11, they found that these issues, ADHD, sleep-related issues, because of the enlarged tonsils and adenoids, do reduce because these tissues can shrink over time. And the more severe the hypertrophy, the more severe the sleep issues are. The bigger the adenoids, the less oxygen they're getting, the more severe are your sleep issues. And also, these are kids that tend to have more severe symptoms of ADHD. So teeth grinding, this is from Sleep 2008. Teeth grinding means more ADHD, more sleep arousals in 66% of cases. 40% kids with more attention and behavioral issues and kids with fewer than nine hours of sleep have three times the obesity risk. So bruxism, the question that always comes to mind is, is it an airway obstruction? We know that when a person, when a child goes to sleep and relaxes, if the airway is too small for any reason, then the throat and the mouth muscles will allow the tongue to obstruct the airway. Common reasons for lack of space in the posterior pharynx. We know obesity is one. Um, narrow airways, tongue ties contribute to that. And when breathing is obstructed, we know that the body is going to try to open the airway because that's a survival mechanism. And it often does this by protruding the mandible and by clenching and grinding on the teeth. And these actions are driven by low oxygen saturation.
So in 2012, at the AADSM Singh had a paper that they published that pediatric sleep-related tooth wear can be used as a clinical marker for pediatric sleep disordered breathing. And for the longest time, I don't know about everybody, but I was told or I learned or I thought that, and I still see, you know, I'll have moms come in and ask, well, it's because their teeth are growing in their jaws, right? And I'm like, maybe, let's look at it a different way. Let's turn it around on its head and see if, is it because of lack of oxygen? Bedwetting, again, as I said, it truly is heartbreaking when you have preteens and teens come into the practice with, because they've exhausted all options. And just this last week, we had two kids at 12, well, he's almost 13 now, um, who we saw, I think we started treating him about four months ago, six months ago, and um, never had an accident, was potty trained by two and a half, no issues at all. And for the past year or so, um, they had issues with bedwetting and they exhausted everything, dietary changes, saw every specialist they could, took away water after a certain amount of time, everything and nothing helped. So when you walk into that operatory and you have a 12 year old that's embarrassed to be there because mom insists on talking about how he wets his bed, think about the social um, development, think about the impact it's having on how he perceives himself, the self-confidence or the lack of because of these issues. It meant no sleepovers for this child, no camp, no hunting trips because he just didn't want to put himself out there and I didn't blame him. When you address the issues that are causing this, that's when you see a 12 year old run down the hallway to give their doctor a hug and doesn't care if he's a boy or not because they're so excited to never to not have that accidents happen again. So we know that again, bedwetting, making sure we're addressing their sleep issues, if that is what is going on, um, can be basically what combination of therapy is going to work. Is it getting the tonsils and adenoids out? Um, do they need to be expanded? Is there a tie that needs to be released? A lot of times um, it's been shown that this combination works well to improve sleep quality and quantity. Because remember, not only do we want enough hours of sleep, we want good quantity of sleep, but we also need that deep sleep, the quality that is going to help them rest. So we know that bedwetting is a common finding in children. It is due to lack of deep sleep. Antidiuretic hormone does not get released. There are frequent microarousals, which again leads to the urge to urinate, directly related to reduced oxygen that these kids are getting. And these kids we also see tend to have less REM sleep if they do go out for a sleep study. So we know that um, removing tonsils and adenoids can improve bedwetting by as much as in 60% of kids. And if this child has a tongue tie, then that can allow the kid to have deeper sleep, less morbidity, um, again, we know, than getting the tonsils out, and sometimes based on what their ENT comes back with, they may or may not be a candidate for TNA. And we know that less REM sleep that these kids are getting, it affects the neurological and hormonal symptoms that, that are related to the adrenal glands. We know that they, these kids need deeper sleep. As I said earlier, snoring is the easiest form of sleep disordered breathing for parents to observe. And I always tell parents, if they're having a hard time convincing their pediatrician or ENT that there's something wrong with how their child is sleeping, um, I tell them, get that fancy iPhone of yours and take a video and share it with the pediatrician. And then if they do not feel that there is an issue, then maybe there is, and maybe you and I are worried about nothing. 
but it helps for the parents to have us as an advocate. And there are times when I get on the phone with pediatricians just to make sure I'm understanding things right. And a lot of times that builds those relationships with them too. So what are the contributing factors that we see for obstructive sleep apnea? You know, be it genetics, nasal, craniofacial. Um, is it is the child older than seven? Although I, two weeks ago, I had a one-year-old that we sent out for a sleep study and came back with pretty severe apnea. So just helps to keep that open mind and look at every child as though with the intention of, is this child truly getting the sleep that they need? Again, history of allergies, is there a family history? Is, is this a, there's something genetic that's going on. Do they have a Malam Padi score of three or four? Checking for enlarged turbinates. Do they have a retrognathic edible? And again, evaluating for deviated nasal septum. AAP. Uh, 2002 said all kids must be screened for snoring. 25 to 50% of kids have some form of sleep disorder. And the signs could be snoring, thrashing, bedwetting, and swollen tonsils. 2016 AAPD policy on obstructive sleep apnea. We know to screen all our patients for snoring as well as sleep disordered breathing, screening our patients for obstructive sleep apnea, assess the tonsils for hypertrophy, assess the position of the tongue, and understanding that obesity may contribute to OSA, like I said, in today's day and age, having those conversations with parents as well as kids. So screening starts in our practice with health history and a parent questionnaire, right? We all have medical histories that they fill out, but modifying that to ask questions related to allergies. How are they doing in school, grades? Have grades started to suffer lately? Or does your child have a hard time focusing, right? Um, can sit still, has ants in her pants, has you know all of these issues that come up. Maybe just maybe it's time to consider um, lack of sleep, quality sleep. Behavioral issues, do they have a hard time getting along with other kids? Medications that the kid may be on, ADHD, snoring. This is the upward sleepiness scale for kids that we use within the practice. Um, again, you have the parents fill out or rank this for I would never ever, or he or she would never ever, to three being a high chance of dosing or sleeping, not seeping. Um, and we have them grade the kids, or their sleep rather, we don't grade our kids, right? And then clinical exam, this is a big one in the practice, you know, gives us lots of clues when we're looking at the kids looking beyond just checking for cavities, gum disease, but we look at the nose, do they have a deviated septum, narrow nostrils? Do we see any kind of enlarged turbinates? Are these kids mouth breathers? When you're sitting there, do you hear noisy breathing? Look at the teeth, what do the buccal corridor look like? Is there enough spacing for the permanent teeth to erupt? Um, what is the eruption looking like? Teeth, are they coming in where there's room, is there enough room for teeth to come in? Looking at the palate, do we have a vaulted palate, narrow palate? Tongue ties, evaluating for tongue ties is, what is the range of motion for the tongue? Looking back further beyond to the back of the mouth, look at the tonsils, do they have enlarged tonsils? So those are things, and again, part of the clinical exam, you know, if you have a panoramic, taking, making sure we can, eva you know, you're looking at that. Is there enough room for the teeth? What is happening with this child? Do they have missing teeth? And these give us a lot of clues as to what it is that may be contributing to the kid feeling the way he or she does. 
So look for tonsils, grade three, grade four. How often is this child sick? Ear infections, stuff like that, asking these questions and making sure we are communicating this to their MDs, to their pediatricians, and having those conversations, not just with the parents, but also with the MDs. Evaluating for tongue ties. Most moms I see within the practice when we talk about after we've evaluated, did you know your child has a tie? Did they have a hard time nursing? Did they have a hard time latching on? Oh, my child doesn't have a tongue tie. Look, she can stick her tongue out so far. Well, that's not quite how we want to look at it. But for us to evaluate it and where is this tongue going to go when this patient sleeps? Definitely not in the roof of the mouth. That's where we want it to rest passively. When we're sitting right now, we consciously, if you think about where your tongue is, it needs to be resting on the incisive papilla, passively resting, strongest muscle in the body. It acts as a natural palatal expander and or retainer for these kids. Well, for this child, you know that tongue had no chance of sitting up there. What's the most likely place that tongue is gonna go? Is back into her throat. So making sure we're evaluating for tongue ties. So what is the role of the dentist? Where do we come into this? We have the tools to impact development of the airway in children. What can we do? We can expand their arches if that's what's needed. We can establish nasal breathing always my first go-to, making sure we're getting rid of mouth breathing and establishing nasal breathing, eliminating habits, bottles, pacifiers if they're young enough. Do they suck their thumb, tongue thrusting? There's so many habits. We need to make sure we're eliminating those and training the tongue. Again, myofunctional therapy plays a big role. What is it that the child needs for us to come up with a quote unquote, treatment plan, because as I said, there is no one size fits all. There's no magic wand that we can wave for these kids to be able to get them to breathe better. But there is treatment modalities, multiple, that we need to implement to be able to get these kids to where we need them to. I am happy to share my screening form, the Upwork. I know Dental Rider has it on the software. I'm a huge fan. I've been playing with it the last ever since John told me about it. I was like, oh, this is so much fun. Amazing tool for communicating with my referring doctors, be it my dentists, MDs, pediatricians, ENTs, we're all over the place. But um, that's my favorite toy in the practice right now, I know. And questions, I am happy to answer questions. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. I am going to exit share screen. Is that all I need to do, Courtney? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Dasani. And um, for those of you that uh, are interested in seeing a peek at the pediatric module that Dr. Dasani just mentioned there, we will be doing a live demonstration after we do the medical billing portion here in a moment. Um, but thank you again so much for sharing all of that knowledge with, with us. That was an awesome presentation. And uh, we wanted to let everybody know that if you're looking for more education in this realm, uh, Dr. Dasani, um, you can see more of her in Dallas on September 27th. So we will post a link to the um, registration for that seminar. Um, and again, thank you so much, Dr. Dasani. That was great. Thank you for having me. Truly my pleasure. All right, and without further ado, let's talk about the medical billing side of this. Um, for this portion, we have Rose Nierman, the founder and CEO of Nierman Practice Management. And uh, we've got a, a great little set here of some new trends and maybe some not some no, new trends that um, you may not be aware of. So um, we will get started here. And thank you, Rose. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dasani. That was really educational. And uh, we're really excited about the course and, and the things that you're doing in your practice. And what I wanted to go over were, were some of the um, trends, as Courtney had mentioned, that we're seeing 
uh, historically, we haven't seen medical insurance pay for uh, pediatric airway. Um, and even surgeries such as phrenectomy and medically necessary orthodontics. And we're starting to see some of the newer policies out there just this year in 2019 have come out and said that, yes, we are looking at this as a possible medical necessity. So let's look at some of those. Um, so with medical insurance and dentistry, as you know, uh, that's what we focus on. What services will you want to, to build to try to get covered? Um, well, when we're talking about the pediatric care, uh, just any of the office visits that come in for that medically necessary reasons. And so you'll use the medical office visit codes for that. Any x-rays uh, that would apply to that medically necessary visit. So if you're doing a PAN uh, and a, or a CEPH view, then there are the medical cross codes and those would go to the medical for those as well. Of course, um, we're starting to see some of the policies state that yes, they will consider oral appliances for OSA. And we've even seen some policies say, yes, we, you know, with the, the proper documentation of medical necessity, we'll consider functional uh, orthopedic appliances as well. Uh, as uh, we reviewed, the phrenectomies are so important for tongue ties. Um, children who have trouble feeding or uh, cannot uh, articulate properly. Uh, also, any trauma cases that you have with kids that should be covered under medical or the accident carrier. And we have seen some policies now, as you know, with the Affordable Care Act, uh, state that they're covering covering medically necessary orthodontics. So those are the different uh, things that uh, we'll talk about. Now, as far as billing those office visits, there are three different sets of codes, uh, medical cross codes for those exams. The first set would be your consultation code. So you can certainly use those with commercial carriers if you're sending a report back to the physician uh, after you, you give it an opinion. Um, you can go forward and treat that patient, but the important thing is the patient was referred and a report must be sent back in order to use that. These uh, 99241 would be the level one consultation, like just a really quick 10 minute consultation. Whereas the 99244 level four would be the 45 minute or more, ex uh, more expanded or detailed. Uh, also, there's um, sets, you know, for the, the five minutes up to the hour new patient exams, and there's also a set of codes for established patients. So those are what you're going to be sending in for your office visits. Now, as far as the radiographs I mentioned, uh, there are different codes uh, for the PAN, FMX, uh, lateral scholar staff, uh, uh, tomography. Um, insurance companies are very, very used to getting these codes. And so uh, they're very familiar with these. And again, it's all gonna come down to your narrative report, your SOAP reports of medical necessity. But also uh, as we go through, Courtney's gonna go through some of the policies we're speaking of. And as we go through, you'll see how important your diagnosis codes are, your ICD-10 codes. Uh, because if you send the code in for a panel, uh, if you don't have a diagnosis that, that states, yes, this is one we cover, then it's not, just not going to go anywhere. Uh, so very important. Um, now, let's look at some policies. Um, as we mentioned, we've been reviewing policies. Let's uh, look at this recent one that came out for OSA in children. Uh, Courtney, I know recently we, we have found that uh, Aetna's publishing uh, this. When did you first notice that uh, they're start, it's trending where they're considering oral appliances now for kids. Yeah, really, this is a, a new development that, that we're seeing within the last six to eight months for the most part. Um, the first one we ever noticed it in was here in, in Aetna's policy, um, that they are considering oral appliances or functional orthopedic appliances medically necessary meaning we will cover it um, for treatment of children with craniofacial anomalies and um, obstructive sleep apnea. So the exciting thing is we're starting to see this exact same language pop up in other policies. So we did gather a few screenshots to share with you here today. 
Um, Aetna is our first one here. Um, the next slide that, that we have coming up is uh, another example of um, a medical policy that has very similar language for coverage of um, oral appliances for pediatric patients. So uh, we have both Evacor um, here, which you'll see that popping up as, um, you know, a third-party processor for different insurers. Um, so that, that has a, a wider breadth there. And the next one, of course, um, we certainly can't share all Blue Cross Blue Shields out there, but we did find a nice example here for Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina, worded just slightly differently, but still stating that oral appliances uh, may be considered medically necessary for significant, uh, clinically significant OSA in children. So, um, of course, there's a ton of Blue Cross, Blue Shield, regionally and statewide out there. So, um, you can certainly check your um, local region's Blue Cross, Blue Shield to see if they have similar language. Now, as far as the diagnosis coding for these services, uh, whether it's, you know, the office visits or x-rays that uh, Rose had mentioned, or the uh, appliances or functional orthopedic appliances, we're still looking at the same diagnosis code that you're used to seeing on your adult cases, G47.33. Um, there still, to this day, is just one diagnosis code for obstructive sleep apnea, whether it's adult or a child, and whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. Uh, there's some additional diagnostic codes that you may end up using to support medical necessity of, of various treatments, um, for example, snoring, mouth breathing, and other specified respiratory disorders. And we do have these built right into the pediatric module and dental writer that we'll be able to give you a peek at soon. Now, this is an interesting find in Aetna's medical policy for OSA and children. They do mention uh, in the policy that they will cover uh, or that the appliances will be medically necessary for children with OSA, which we know that diagnostic code, but they also mention uh, the child needs to have craniofacial anomalies. And in their coverage policy, you'll see there um, on the lower right-hand corner of the slide, the coding sets for the uh, diagnosis codes that Aetna considers craniofacial anomalies that obstruct the upper airway. And those include the major anomalies of jaw size, as well as anomalies of jaw to cranial base relationships. So, uh, you know, we did heavily consider uh, these, these coverage policies while we were uh, creating the pediatric module. All right, so big question is what do we build the appliance under? So um, interestingly enough, in, in Aetna's medical coverage policy, as, as well as others, you will see Again, the same code that we use for the um, adult sleep appliances, E0486 for an oral device or appliance that's used to reduce upper airway collapsibility. Now, E0486 is specific to the custom-made appliances. Uh, the prefabricated ones do have their their own code. So, uh, and always keep in mind, we want to use that modifier NU when billing medical insurance for these appliances, which stands for new equipment. <clears throat> now, um, some other things you will find as you look at the medical policies for sleep apnea treatment in children, uh, many policies will have a section for what they consider either not medically necessary or currently experimental and investigational. So um, here's an example of when the orthodontic treatment, um, such as rapid maxillary expansion, is considered dental in nature per Aetna's policy. So just some things to keep an eye out for.
Now, another thing we're um, seeing some really great uh, positive coverage statements for across multiple insurers is the uh, phrenectomy and phrenotomy medical policies. Um, so, you know, tying right in with what uh, Dr. Dasani was sharing with us this evening, uh, we can see coverage for these services as well under the medical policy. Now, uh, we're going to use Aetna again here. We love their policies because they tend to be so detailed, but we'll see a few other examples. Um, Aetna's policy very clearly states here that they will consider inferior lingual phrenectomy or lingual phrenotomy for ankyloglossia medically necessary when either there's newborn feeding difficulties or childhood articulation problems. Now, we're also going to see some um, similar policies here from a few other insurers, um, AmeriHealth. Very uh, similar coverage criteria, but just worded a little differently. So, uh, this policy does state that it's considered medically necessary and therefore covered for any of the following symptoms. And they list out the difficulty feeding or eating, difficulty chewing, swallowing, and speech impairment as covered procedures. And, and the important thing to remember is there's a code for all of that. That's my, my famous saying when uh, we go out to dinner or out, out anywhere and someone talks about something that happened to someone, I'm like, there's a code for that. There's a medical code for that. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the good thing is there are codes for all of this. So just you know, keep in mind that a lot of the symptoms that you see do have a, a corresponding ICD 10 code as well. Yeah, the last example we have here for phrenectomy or phrenotomy is from WellCare, which uh, very similar language to the Aetna policy where they state that the inferior lingual phrenectomy or lingual phrenotomy is considered medically necessary and a covered benefit with the newborn feeding difficulties or childhood articulation problems. And as Rose mentioned, there's a code for that. <laughs> so Q38.1 is, is by far the most common one we will see with those cases since um, that is the, the sole diagnosis code currently for the tongue tie or ankylosha. Um, you'll also, you know, see some other malformations, um, such as the, the labial frenum issues, um, which end up getting classified under Q38.0 for congenital malformations of the lips, not elsewhere classified. Now, another thing we see uh, many of our pediatric patients sometimes uh, presenting with, not necessarily related to managing the childhood airway, but uh, a lot of us run into these situations where we have some trauma. And great news is um, medical plans do typically cover trauma cases, um, you know, under, under the, the appropriate circumstances. And you will see that we, we have accounted for that as well in the new pediatric module for dental riders. So um, here's an example of a medical policy from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island for dental services for accidental injury. And uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island will cover treatment um, of that accidental injury as long as it is sound natural teeth and it's received within 72 hours. Um, so we're looking at things like, um, you know, extracting the teeth, suturing, re-implanting and stabilization of dislodged teeth, um, repositioning and stabilization of partly dislodged and x-rays. So I'm sure many of you have a few cases running through your head at the moment on, oh, yeah, I just saw that, that child two or three weeks ago that got hit in the face with a baseball or got pushed on the playground and, and you know, smacked into the swing set or uh, anything like that. <laughs> and the key thing to remember for any of the Blue Cross Blue Shields, the Blue Cross uh, Blue Shield of your state is where it says within 72 hours. In these accident cases, whether it's a child or an adult, 
uh, very important that that patient's seen right away because almost all policies state we have to see the patient within you know two two or three days or 48 or 72 hours for it to be covered. So very important, get that patient seen, whether it would be in your office or uh, if they can't come to your office at the time, uh, tell them to go to urgent care or the emergency room because they will have been seen then within that time frame. And there's also codes for that. <laughs> so um, again, with uh, kind of like sharing Blue Cross Blue Shield policies, uh, we would be here for a good majority of the night if we were to share every available uh, trauma-related diagnostic code for you. But uh, just keep in mind that any situation that you run into that's trauma-related, there's not only codes for the trauma to the teeth or the oral cavity, but there's also codes that will describe how the, the trauma happened as well. So uh, we see here um, some diagnostic codes related to partial loss of teeth. And you'll see this uh, description does specify due to trauma. And then it's just broken down by classes or unspecified if you don't know the class. Now, the, the last section we have here on the medical billing portion is related to medically necessary ortho, um, which we have seen some really great developments for coverage for ortho services for pediatric patients, uh, mainly due to the Affordable Care Act and the essential health benefits that um, have to be included um, so we see here in Aetna's policy, they do state that the medical policy will cover comprehensive medically necessary ortho for members who have a severe handicapping malocclusion that's related to a condition such as the, the few they have listed here, cleft palate or other congenital craniofacial or dentofacial malformations. Uh, trauma involving the oral cavity and requiring surgical treatment, um, or skeletal anomalies involving maxillary um, or mandibular structures. Now, of course, as with anything we do in medical billing, the, the medical insurer will be looking for your clinical documentation to ensure that the patient meets their coverage criteria. So, uh, Aetna's policy for pediatric um, uh, ortho does specify that they're expecting to see a score of 42 points or greater on the modified Salzman index in order for the patient to meet criteria. They also mentioned that uh, this treatment plan should be with the physician and the dentist um, in collaboration. Uh, they're even nice and give you a link straight to the Salzman evaluation form right in the policy. So here's a screenshot of that. Yes, and, and all of this information too uh, can be entered in the uh, pediatric module dental writer as well um, because it, it includes um, the sections not only for child airway but uh, for nectomies uh, malfunctional therapy and medically necessary ortho too. Absolutely. Now you may be thinking to yourself, what type of diagnostic codes am I going to use for, for these cases? So um, there are, um, you know, several different diagnostic codes to stand for different malocclusions. And as you can see here, anomalies of dental arch relationship. Um, you'll see in some of the medical policies, they will list out, for example, if the patient has a minimum of a, an X amount millimeter of overjet or overbite or crowding, that that will qualify them for the coverage. So we see some examples here for crowding of teeth, excessive spacing, anomalies of dental arch relationships. So uh, as Dr. Dasani mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, you know, every case is different. Every patient is a snowflake. So it just depends on the, the patient's condition, uh, which ones we're selecting here. 
All right, those are interesting policies. Uh, so in just a moment, I'm going to uh, let everyone have a peek at the orthodontic module. So I'll, I'll do um, a quick review of that. Um, but I know uh, we wanted to let you know about some upcoming courses as well that we have. Yes, so for, for those of you looking for some um, a more intense uh, education in the dental sleep medicine realm, we do have a wonderful mini residency uh, starting soon in September. It is a three session mini residency. The first session is September 6th and 7th. You'll see it there near the top of the slide with Dr. Mayor Patel and Dr. Terry Bennett. And uh, we'll start off in Atlanta, September 6th and 7th. Um, the next session is in November in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, November 15th and 16th. And the final session of that mini residency is in Atlanta, uh, January 24th and 25th. So the mini residencies are limited groups. We have just a few spots left. So if you're interested, please uh, you know, give us a call. Uh, the number listed on your screen, 800-879-6468. You can feel free to email us at contactus at dentalwriter.com, or you can visit us online at nearmanpm.com. Um, uh, as you can see there on the right side of your screen, we also do uh, some wonderful cross-coding um, for medical billing and dentistry seminars throughout the country all year long. Uh, our next one coming up is uh, just this weekend in Jupiter, Florida, um, but our next appearance will be in Atlanta. Um, we do, do cross-coding courses many times side by side with our clinical sessions. So there's kind of something there for the whole team and everybody can come and and uh, you know, learn their side of things, um, followed by Long Beach in September for the 13th and 14th. So uh, whether it's for sleep or TMD or medical billing and dentistry, we, we hope to see you at one of our upcoming seminars. Sure. All right. Um, so as we mentioned, we've got uh, Dental Writer has the new, a new tool the pediatric narrative report writer and, and uh, also will uh, complete the medical claim form. Uh, so just like we have the questionnaire and exam uh, that generates your narratives for sleep apnea, TMD, uh, oral surgeries and implants, uh, we now have the, the new pediatric uh, for airway, phrenectomies, trauma, medically necessary ortho and functional therapy. So after looking at these policies, I, we know that you need the tool uh, to make this happen. Uh, so let me just uh, pull this up right here in the dental writer. And uh, uh, what I'm going to do is, is uh, start with the patient questionnaire, but let's just get our bearings here. Uh, as you know, dental writer is a four step process. So you've got your patient questionnaire, your exam, matching exam, uh, what that's going to happen after that's entered in, it's going to generate your SOAP report of medical necessity. And that's step three. And step four will be where it completes the medical claim form. Um, so this is uh, the pediatric questionnaire. And um, let's go ahead and take a peek at this. And as you can see from the webinar we just went through, these are uh, so many of the symptoms Dr. Dasani had mentioned. Of, about the, her patients and your patients uh, appear with. And so we uh, divided these uh, into pediatric sleep, daily function, daytime sleepiness, uh, oral symptoms, uh, including infant feeding difficulties um, and uh, speech pronunciation difficulties, uh, tongue tie, and, and many others. Now, um, what's really great about Dental Writer is it is customizable. And so if you, you know, want to add things, it can be added, uh, things can be moved around as well. So uh, that's the chief complaint screen. And so once we get that entered in, I'm going to go into the medical history form and I'm going to enter the patient's medical history uh, because all of these things, you know, ADD, asthma, ear infections, headaches, mood disorder, uh, and even prior orthodontic treatment are all really important to uh, evaluating this case. 
Uh, so next on the patient questionnaire, I'm going to list the history, at the uh, treatment history. Now, this is important because we want to know uh, what other methods the, the patient has tried. And you know, in many cases, they've been everywhere. This is also important because this would be the list of practitioners that you're going to want to send that SOAP report to uh, once it's generated. Uh, so the SOAP report is meant not only for the medical insurance, but to communicate with the um, um, patients, uh, the uh, parents, and the physicians and, and get the word out. This is just really amazing how uh, sending reports to these physicians that say, this is, we wanted to keep you informed of our mutual patient. Here's a report. It's very powerful. On the feeding and speech uh, questionnaire, a uh, patient can describe any speech uh, articulation problems or uh, infants with any feeding or latching difficulties. Uh, and then the uh, pediatric sleep questionnaire is going to answer the questions whether or not the patient uh, uh, snores, of course, gaps for air, uh, what's the bed, uh, sleeps restlessly, um, breathes through the nose or their mouth, excuse me, and uh, seem tired and fatigued. So it's, it's, as you can see, it's very, very detailed and gives you a wonderful history uh, to help evaluate what the next step would be here. And then also uh, the outward sleep questionnaire, of course, it's gonna be different uh, for children and adult adolescents. So this is the outward uh, for the children and adolescents. And uh, keep in mind the magic number that they're looking for is the same with adults. They, uh, most policies say the patient has to have an Epworth sleepiness scale of over 10. Okay. So that's the questionnaire. Now we're going to go to the exam, step two. And the exam form is going to, of course, uh, be the uh, maxillary, the mandibular exam, uh, airway uh, uh, exam, tonsils, uh, and uh, cranial facial, looking for any cranial facial anomalies, uh, including, of course, um, like I said, the arch form. Um, we've got the melon patty here in the tongue. And once we get down to this section, uh, the phrenectomies and items for functional therapy as well, uh, such as the habits the patients present with and uh, other things um, that affect uh, the patient such as uh, swallowing and uh, forward head posture uh, as well uh, is, is, well, it's, it gets quite detailed, but uh, again, it's customizable, but all of this is important. There, there we are, the uh, uh, forward head posture. So as you can see, it's very detailed. On this side, the medically necessary orthodontics, now that's where we're gonna get a little more, a little more dental. But uh, unless, you know, if you're not billing for orthodontics, you want to keep it, of course, more jaw related um, and airway related and, uh, and function. Uh, and if you are billing a policy for those medically necessary orthodontics, this is the type of information, of course, that they're going to want to see regarding that. Uh, now, uh, you can put your x-ray results in the imaging tab. And once we get to the assessment, um, all of your diagnosis codes, your ICD-10 codes that we talked about that you're going to need are here, including anomalies of jaw size, uh, uh, maxillary and mandibular hypoplasia, uh, childhood articulation problems, um, obstructive sleep apnea, and uh, asymmetry of the jaw, as well as ankyloglossia um, and any other um, feeding difficulties or speech difficulties they may have. And also, we, we cover quite well the medically necessary ortho and accident cases as well will be covered in this. Now, as far as the plan, we're going to decide, okay, we're we doing the phrenectomies, are we doing a custom appliance? It could be jaw expansion or mandibular advancement. Um, so it's very well thought out here. And um, not to mention how important it is to say why the treatment's medically necessary. So already you've started with, this is medically necessary because of the chief complaints the patient's having, because of your exam findings and your diagnosis. And I'm gonna reiterate why this airway treatment or the phrenectomy of the surgery or any other therapy is truly medically necessary. 
very important. And here's where we get to the very important part where we're going to start billing our services. So on the services tab, we can say, okay, we uh, completed a SAF. That's going, maybe a PAM, that's going to write that in your narrative report. That's also going to uh, send the CPT codes along with the ICD-10 diagnosis codes over to your medical claim. So it's completing the medical uh, claim as you go for the services that we did today. Uh, so very complete. As you can see, we uh, have the uh, radiographs, the uh, phrenectomies, oral appliances. And if you're doing sedation, there are codes for that as well. Um, so what, once you complete the questionnaire and exam, what it's going to do is I'm going to say, okay, step three, I'd like to generate my SOAP report. And it's going to uh, generate everything into Microsoft Word and bring up your beautiful SOAP report. <laughs> I, mean, I still like to see these uh, reports generate. <laughs> uh, but uh, it just you know, pulls everything together for you very nicely. The subjective, the objective, the assessment, with the did, it, did it say yes for what's the bed? Oh, that's right. Where is this? Where did I see that? Oh, yes. What's the bed? Are did, you you're using me as the patient? And I, did you notice I'm using my <laughs> as the patient? I'm sorry, John. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> you just noticed that. <laughs> it's recorded now, buddy. <laughs> yeah, this is <laughs> hypothetical. You're, you're, you're a sample patient. Okay. <laughs> All right. I didn't think you'd know this. It was one time, all right. Now it's yeah, that's right. Time. Okay, I get one time. <laughs> um, all right. As you can see, we also have fun. And and your plan, of course, with your CPT code. So uh, very neat, very excited about this. And uh, you know, you can everything that uh you see is gonna go on there. <laughs> and step four is now I'm gonna go get my claim form. So everything I clicked on is now uh, developing into my uh, medical claim. So the ICD and the CPT codes are just gonna come right on over here. I'm gonna say, okay, that looks good. I like those codes and it's uh, gonna pop up with your medical claim, step four, okay, so. Uh, as you, you know, we have the modules uh, for uh, adult <laughs> dental sleep medicine, <laughs> uh, TMJ disorders, and oral surgery, including bone grafts, implants, and any oral surgeries that you would uh, perform in uh, the dental office that could be medically necessary. So um, that's uh, been, being updated too. The oral surgery module is um, uh, something that has become very popular recently because we are seeing a lot of the dental insurance companies are now uh, not even looking at surgery until you send it to medical first and, and then they'll evaluate whether they're going to pay or not. So it's almost becoming a necessity uh, with the oral surgeries as well to build to medical. Um, so those, that's the dental writer and the new pediatric module. We're very excited about it and uh, if you have any questions about it, we're here for you. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Rose. That was a, a great walkthrough of the new pediatric module. As Rose mentioned, um, if you are a current dental writer client, feel free to uh, give us a call if you have any questions about it. If you're just looking into dental writer, uh, you know, feel free to give us a call to schedule a demo so you can uh, see it a little more up close. And uh, with that, um, I do see we have a, a few questions, um, you know, rolling into the chat box and the Q&A box. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and wrap up the session for this evening. I know we're a little bit past the hour, but uh, we will hang around and answer your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, or if uh, uh, you need to take off, we will certainly follow up with you via email. So. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening for the Nearman Practice Management Tuesday evening webinar. And um, thank you again, Rose and Dr. Dasani, for, for taking the time to educate us. All righty. You're so welcome. And thank you, uh, Courtney, for your contribution as well, your wonderful contribution. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, thank you. And everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>